Hi, everyone. Oh, it, it works. Great. Mic's on. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining me. Uh, you probably already noticed that my throat and my voice is a little bit croaky. I uh, did a two-day workshop on Monday and Tuesday, and I'm not used to speaking for two days straight to other people. So if my voice cuts out halfway through, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun just looking at slides. Um, I'll do my best. So yeah, thank you so much for coming along. My name is Damien Brady. I am the Developer Advocacy Manager at GitHub. Uh, I am based in Australia. Did anybody come and see um, my colleague Mish Manners talk uh, on GitHub Copilot? Yeah, a few hands. You might be forgiven for thinking that GitHub is an Australian company at this point because there's two of us here and we're both Australian. It's just coincidence. Um, Oslo is kind of one of my favorite places to have events. It was NDC Oslo was my first big uh, international event, and so I think this is number five for me. First time in about three years, though, so I'm super excited to be back. And as always, I'm going to talk to you about DevOps today. Um, Sometimes I talk really technical about you know the way you could can construct your you know workflows for pipelines for your CI/CD, and sometimes I I pull back a little bit and I talk a little bit about uh, fundamentals and what is important with DevOps and things like that. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on today, rather than talking about specific technologies and things to to actually solve these problems. We're going to be talking about how to address the problems themselves and specifically how to know when stuff is not working and be able to you know, come back to these fundamentals to work out what you can do to change what's happening in your organizations so that DevOps is a bit more effective. All right. Now, uh, I've been talking about DevOps and Dev process and things for about 10 or so years, a little bit more than that now. Um, and in that time, I've spoken to a whole lot of different companies and a whole lot of different people, and I've heard a lot of cases where DevOps has done great things and it's improved people's software delivery processes. But I've also spoken to a huge number of companies and people where DevOps has been this thing that gets implemented and it goes terribly wrong and makes everybody's lives miserable. And it doesn't really improve outcomes very much. And this happens a lot. And you'd be forgiven for thinking if it keeps happening, then maybe DevOps is the problem. Right? I'm going to argue today that DevOps can't be the problem by definition. And let me explain. So there's a lot of different ways that DevOps can be defined. Um, I've always liked this definition from Donovan Brown, who is, uh, has been at Microsoft for a long time. There's a couple of reasons I like this definition of DevOps. Um, the most important one was that he was my boss when he wrote this definition, and so everything he wrote was perfect. Um, but also, it's a really good definition, and it doesn't dictate what stuff you have to do. It talks more about the fundamentals of what you're trying to achieve. So it is that DevOps is the union of people, process, and technologies to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. Now, whenever I uh, present this definition, I like to focus on a few different parts of it. One part is the, the first bit, that it's a union of people, process, and technologies. It's not one thing. It's the entire ecosystem around how software is being developed and implemented and delivered in your organization. Both the technologies that you use, yes, the tooling can be important. Good tools can make your life much easier. And the process that those tools enable is really important as well, but the people are just as important. What commonly happens in organizations that are having trouble with DevOps is that the instruction to do DevOps comes from you know, up on high. And, and the managers have been to a conference, not saying anybody here is in this boat, but the managers go to a conference and they hear that DevOps is this thing that we absolutely must do. And so they go back to their organizations and they say, right, we are now doing DevOps. Uh, so as far as I understand it, that means that our Engineers are now DevOps engineers, um, and other than that, nothing's really going to change. And so you get this instruction from up on high that now we're doing DevOps, but the people down below, they're not bought into this at all. They're just being told, well, now you have to build pipelines, you have to do deployments this way, you know, you have to build your software in a repeatable way, um, no patches anymore, you've got to rebuild the entire application, and 
put it over the top of the old application. All of these things that they're not involved in the decisions behind how this is implemented. They're just told this is the way we're working. And that's where the people can uh, not be a problem, but the people cannot buy into you know, these DevOps implementations. And it means that DevOps just doesn't work. So people, process, and the technologies. So if the people involved in your software delivery and software engineering do not believe in this you know, idea of, of delivering value on a continuous basis, it's just not going to work. It doesn't matter how good your process or your technologies are. Same thing goes for the process. Even if the people are great, if the process involves, you know, before we get to production, we need sign-off from department heads in six different organizations, and uh, they need to do a signature once a week, you know, with the change advisory board. And uh, so, you know, you have this great pipeline, but it gets stalled waiting until, you know, Brett is back from holidays. Right? So the process is, falling, is failing you there. And again, technology is probably the least important part, to be honest. You can implement DevOps really effectively with your own scripts, right? Um, but some, of some really good tools make your life a lot easier. So there you go. That's the first bit, people, process, products. The other thing, which I think is more important, is the word value in here. So DevOps is not about delivering software to production or features or code changes or you know this ticket that was on the left-hand side of your scrum board, putting that over to the right-hand side and then putting that in production, that ticket doesn't necessarily represent value. What we should care about is whether what we're putting in production is actually valuable to the people who are using it or the people who depend on your software. Now, that could mean that you, would imp you spend all this time implementing something and you deliver it into production and customers do not like it and quite often when uh, DevOps fails or when it fails to improve the situation is when you keep delivering stuff really, really fast, but you're delivering the wrong stuff. So there's constant rework. You're delivering features that people don't want or features that are not performing the way that you want them to perform. So unless you're focusing on whether what you're delivering is valuable, you're not doing DevOps really either. So when I, when I talk about all these different areas and things that can fail, um, what I'm really getting at is that um, DevOps itself is aimed at achieving these goals, about delivering valuable stuff into production, using all of the people and the process and the products. But it's, the definition of DevOps is that you are improving this by delivering value into production. Right? So if DevOps is not working in your organization, that's an implementation problem. It's not a DevOps problem. By definition, DevOps is about delivering value in a faster way to customers. Right? So if you are having trouble with DevOps in your organization, that's an implementation problem rather than a problem with the word DevOps or the definition of DevOps. Now at this point, some of you are probably thinking, great, Damien, you've successfully defended the word DevOps. Problem solved, right? Now I, now I can go back to my company and say, turns out, you know, DevOps is not working here, but it's because we're not doing DevOps properly, right? Problem solved. Obviously, no. Uh, not only have I not solved any problems, I've probably made everybody feel worse because if there are problems with DevOps in your organization, all I've told you now is that you're doing it wrong, which is the worst possible thing I can be telling you, right? That's not my intention. My intention is to highlight um, some areas where um, you can reflect on what's happening in your organizations and tie them back to the fundamentals behind DevOps, what DevOps is actually trying to achieve, and then make some changes in your organization so that you can um, pull everything back on the right track. Okay, great. So far I've, um, I've successfully probably annoyed a few of you by telling you you're doing it wrong. Let's talk about what is actually involved in DevOps. So who's seen a, a diagram like this about a million times when anybody talks about DevOps? Yeah, it's like the the ubiquitous infinity of DevOps that everybody presents and then doesn't really explain a great deal. So the idea with this, um, this symbol is that you, you have your idea and you, you know, come up with your planning, you do all your planning, um, you have your ideas, the things you want to implement, you build them, you, know, you write your code, you do your tests, and then you ship them into production ultimately. And then when it's in production, 
you try to get feedback from your customers to work out whether you know what you've done is correct. And then based on that feedback, you know, the things that are working really well, the things that aren't working, that feeds back into your planning so that you have better ideas and you can tune what stuff you're doing and then you build that and you ship that and you learn from that and so on. The idea really with DevOps is to do this as fast as you possibly can with as small a pieces as you can in a safe way that allows you to change direction and be agile and uh, basically deliver stuff that you know is valuable because you've been learning into production as fast as possible, right? Um, I was speaking to my, my boss, Martin Woodward, about this a little while ago. And he, he likes this kind of visualization of this infinity symbol that just gets faster and faster and faster. But it also gets smaller and smaller and tighter until all of a sudden you've just got this constant flow of idea, production, learning, tweaking, and so on. And it just becomes this you know, visual flow of process, I guess. Any kind, anytime there's an idea, there's just a process and that idea will get into production because everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. You know, you write the code, you learn from the customers, you ship it, you build it. If, you cha if you've done the wrong thing, you change direction, you do something else and so on. And it's a beautiful kind of metaphor, like of, of cycling and you can see the visual, right? The lights you know, shining over there and it gets all blurry and it's beautiful and so on. In practice though, this takes a little bit of time sometimes. There's different aspects to this infinity symbol that, that are easier to implement than others. Um, and honestly, a lot of people don't need to, um, you don't need to address all of these areas. Um, you focus on certain parts of it. So to get a little bit less abstract, I guess, quite often when people implement DevOps, they look at this spot and not really much further. They don't go out to the rest of the infinity symbol. This is the bit where we've built our code and now we need to ship it into production, right? So that's where CI, CD comes in. So you've built your code, you've implemented whatever feature somebody has told you to implement, and now how do we get that, that piece of code that I wrote into production? Well, we have a continuous integration build, we use a build server, you know, we compile it, we run all our tests, and we do that automatically, and then we end up with this thing that we can deploy, this artifact. We deploy it to a test environment. If that works, then we automatically deploy it to our own production environment, and you know, DevOps is finished, right? Now, the reason people start and finish here with the CI CD when they're talking about DevOps is you get a huge amount of benefit just from improving that little part of this cycle, right? For relatively little effort. So you, are, as an engineer, are, are building your software all the time locally, right? If you can make some changes, build it locally, see it's okay, and then commit that change, and from that point on, you know that if it hasn't broken any tests and it's, it's serving the purpose it's supposed to serve, it'll get into production with this automatic process. If you think about the speed that you're going through this infinity symbol, like that's gonna massively improve your speed. There's always a really big like um, delay, I guess, if you're doing this stuff manually between writing the code and getting it into production. So I've worked at a bunch of companies um, in the past where uh, the, the deployment part is really, really hard, right? You, you have your code, you build it locally, everybody's got their own local versions. You kind of, that wasn't me, I promise. You kind of merge it all together and then there's some merge conflicts and you have to build it again and the, you deploy it to a server and it doesn't actually work quite right because the server's a little bit different than what your local dev machines work. And so you, you process that and then you try to put it in production and it goes into production but some bits aren't working because it's not the same as your test environment. And so you spend the weekend trying to get this stuff working. Meanwhile, your customers can't use your product. You know, it's this big, long, drawn out, really painful process. And the natural reaction to that is this horrible process that's really difficult. We don't want to do that regularly because that's horrible. We hate doing that. Let's just do that every month or every three months or so. The downside of that is that now you have three months of work that you're trying to shove into this one release. Right? So you have three months of changes that you're trying to implement in production, trying to put into production. If something doesn't work, what part of that three months of work didn't work? Like, which part of it 
broke the build. Which part of it broke the deployment? So the, the less frequently you do this, the harder it is to diagnose and the harder it is to get it right. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but what you want to do is do it more regularly. So the more frequently you go through that pain, the more likely you are to fix those pain points to make it easier next time. So one thing that I keep seeing in organizations is that, is that they don't um, appreciate that it's going to get worse before it gets better. So when you start implementing DevOps, especially the CI CD part, when you start implementing DevOps in your organization, it's really hard to start off with because the pressure to get this running really, really fast, deploying frequently and things like that, that's, that pressure is really high, but to actually do it is really difficult. It's still just as hard as it was when you did it every three months. It's just now you're being forced to do it every week. Right? You kind of got to push through that stage um, and fix the problem so that it gets smoother and smoother and smoother. The harder something is, the more you should do it. All right, I've talked enough about this slide. Let's talk a little bit about um, the fundamentals of DevOps and what, what that means for not just the CI CD part, but what it means for that whole life cycle. So to work out what is going wrong in your organization when, you're, when you've implemented DevOps and it's not quite working, we need to kind of step back to the fundamentals of what DevOps is and what it's supposed to achieve. Um, there's some, the, the more I look into DevOps, the more I kind of gr uh, gravitate towards the thought leaders, to use a, a, an overused term. term in um, DevOps. So these are the people who think about not, not you know, the best way to build a Helm chart, but think about you know, what's involved in DevOps and what our aims are and how we can actually achieve those aims at a broader level. There's three people in particular that I always um, refer to when I'm talking about any kind of DevOps fundamentals. Um, and that's uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Gene Kim, and Jez Humble. Now, um, they're all incredible people who have published a, a lot of really useful literature around DevOps. What they talk about is um, rather than you know, the really specific things about, okay, here's how you should structure your um, application architecture to make the most of you know, using Kubernetes and stuff like that. They don't really talk about that stuff. They talk about what is actually valuable in DevOps and how you get better, um, better performance and better outcomes with your software delivery. Now, some of the, the um, literature they've written, they, they've written a ton of stuff, but here are kind of my top four books. The most recent one is, is there on the left, which is called Accelerate. That's actually authored by all three of them. Um, Dr. Nicole Forsgren is kind of uh, an absolute powerhouse when it comes to um, linking real research and real data to outcomes when it comes to DevOps. So you might, have, might be familiar with the State of DevOps report that used to come out kind of every year. I think it still lives on. There's plenty of states of DevOps reports, but I think the last one she was involved with was about 2019. And that's where a lot of these facts that we, we spew on stage, things like um, you know, high-performing DevOps teams deploy 2,500 and something times more frequently, and they have far fewer change failures. And when they do fail, they can solve it seven times faster and things like that. That's all based on research that um, Nicole and, and partners have, have done as well. So Accelerate is kind of the, the latest um, book from her and from a few other people. Um, totally worth reading. It's, it's incredibly good when it comes to tying you know, what's important in DevOps and what's important in software delivery to you know, outcomes. Um, the next one, DevOps Handbook, has been around for quite a while. I think that's authored by, again, uh, it's, been, it's authored by Gene Kim, I think, and Jez Humble, but it's recently had additions to it from Dr. Nicole Forsgren as well, so all three of them. Um, the last two, though, are kind of great books to read if you don't like reading textbooks, which I don't. Um, I co-authored a TFS one that's about that thick a while ago, and I haven't read it. I read the chapters I wrote, but I haven't read anything else. Um, I don't really like reading those big, heavy, here are the instruction manuals kind of thing. The Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project are novels, they're stories. Um, and they're really engaging. Sometimes they're a little bit too close to home. There's you know, scenes in there about 
deployments going wrong and people staying up and blaming each other and things like that. And it feels a little bit PTSD sometimes. But they're really, really good stories. They're great, great to actually read. Um, and from them, Gene Kim, who was, who's the main author, uh, came up with these three ways of DevOps and in the Unicorn Project, the five ideals. So the five ideals are these um, kind of five areas where he, he says these are the ideal scenarios for a DevOps um, practice, for a DevOps organization. Um, and if you can reach those five ideals, you're doing a really good job. Um, I'm going to actually focus on those five ideals to kind of talk through some of the fundamentals and what's important. So these are the five ideals that Gene um, mentions. There's locality and simplicity, focus, flow, and joy, improvement of daily work, psychological safety, and customer focus. So we're going to talk through all all five of these. I was about to say all three, but I'm jumping the gun. All five of these. Um, and we're going to start with not the first one, but actually the first three. Now, it would be it would be horrible of me to say that Gene Kim got it wrong, because that can't possibly be true. Um, but I kind of link these first three in together. They all kind of mean a similar thing in my mind. Um, let me explain. So if locality and simplicity means that to do your daily work as an engineer or, or anybody involved in software delivery, you can do that independently without having to you know, go out to somebody else in your organization to get them to provision a server for you so you can run your tests. Or um, I, know, I remember the first job I ever had, we wrote our software, and then if we needed any database changes, we would have to write a database change script and then take that to the DBAs, and then they would apply that to our test server on their own time. You know, they had different priorities than us. That's fine. But it meant that there was no locality there. I couldn't just finish my job. I had to go and reach out to other people to get them to finish the job. Um, Gene refers to this kind of as, I think he calls it the coffee index or the coffee value. Who's familiar with like the bus factor? Has anybody heard that term? So the bus factor is, you know, how bad would things be if, if somebody got hit by a bus? Or it's a, not a great visual, but if somebody wasn't there anymore, you know, what knowledge are they going to take with them? That's a, it's a risk to your organization. The coffee factor is, is similar, but it's a bit more like, um, how many people do I have to take out for a coffee before I can get my job done? And so you want your coffee factor to be as low as possible. Uh, you want to be able to do all of your work independently, and so that's what the locality means. And it should be simple to do. It shouldn't involve doing a whole lot of yak shaving to go and implement all this other stuff to get my job done. So locality and simplicity. Focus, flow, and joy is kind of related, where it means, can I just do my work and focus on doing that work? Can I get into a flow state? If you're an engineer or a programmer, you're probably familiar with a flow state where everything outside just disappears, you do your work, you're getting stuff done, and then when you look up, it's two hours later and you've just been incredibly productive. As much as possible, you should enable your teams to stay in that flow state. Not, I have to do this work, oh, actually, that means I need to go and open this other project because that's a library that I'm relying on. I have to compile that one first so I can make that change and come back and, oh, actually, that's, you know, that's this team over here. I need to go and talk to them to get this working and so on. And that leads to joy in your work, which means to, which, sorry, which leads to better productivity, getting things done a lot better. So focus, flow, and joy is related, and it's allowing um, your teams to focus on what they're doing and actually get into this flow state and be productive. And then improvement of daily work is, again, related. Day to day, can you improve the way that your processes work and that your systems work so that you can get into these flow states and you can do your work in a local way, in a simple way? Um, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, was quoted, and I'm going to misquote him here because I don't remember it, but something along the lines of that if you ever have a choice between writing new features and improving the way your engineering systems work, you should choose the engineering systems every time because that has flow-on effects. If I, if I can save every single developer in my organization five minutes every time they want a context switch, I should do that. It's not going to take much longer uh, sorry, it's not going to take very long before that gives us m far better benefits than, you know, spending the time writing that feature. 
It's a little bit the sharpening the axe metaphor, where you keep chopping the tree and you're getting slower and slower, but if you just stopped for 10 minutes and sharpened the axe, you'd be able to continue and, and do a lot better. So improving your daily work, improving the lives of everybody in your team, developers or, or engineers or ops people or even support people, marketing people, anything like that, improving your daily work will lead to better outcomes as well. So you can see why I'm kind of grouping these three into, into one. They're almost all about improving daily work, right? They're improving how productive people are and how much uh, they can get things done, right? So linking this back to uh, how this actually um, impacts an organization trying to implement DevOps. If stuff is slow or stuff is not working or people are actually engineers are not enjoying their work, have a look at some of this stuff. Maybe your engineers are not enjoying their work because every time they need to make a change, they've got to go and speak to Barry over in the, in the infrastructure team and he gets 15 coffees a day and he's never at his desk. That's not going to lead to you know, particularly productive and happy environments. And those are important. Now, to actually properly implement this, I found kind of one implementation um, detail, I guess, that I find um, is the most important for this. And it's a little bit controversial. I know large companies don't like doing this, but it's having self-sufficient cross-functional feature teams. Now let me break that down a little bit. What I mean is that if you have a product with 30 different features in it or 30 different parts of that product, it's really tempting to say, well, here's our UI team, here's our you know, business um, enablement team that covers you know, the customer stuff, and here's the you know, business process team that does all of this stuff, and then there's the database team that does this, you know, all of the stuff for these databases, and then there's the infrastructure team that manages it and support and so on like that. Having these um, cross-functional team, sorry, having these, not cross-functional, but um, siloed kind of specialized teams seems like a great idea and it is from a management perspective if you treat everybody as you know, a resource. But in practice it means that people don't get this locality, this simplicity. They can't focus on their work because they're constantly relying on another team that has a whole different set of priorities. So when I say self-sufficient cross-functional feature teams, what I mean is trying to organize your teams in verticals. So that entire feature from idea and speaking to customers all the way through to implementing it, putting it in production, and, um, and even supporting it in production, right, should be one team, one individual team. Right? Yes, you can have some like, cross-cutting teams, the, the DBA team that makes sure our databases are patched and up-to-date and so on, but they shouldn't be the bottleneck when this feature team needs to make a database change. right? So having these vertical slices means that it means a couple of things. It means that the engineers on these teams end up having ownership over the code that they're writing. If you think about DevOps as a way of combining the dev and ops teams at its you know, most basic level, um, the whole idea by combining those teams is that you don't have these two teams that rely on each other but have opposite aims. right? The dev team does their work and then they throw it over the wall to the ops team and the ops team you know, can implement it and complain about the dev team and the dev team complains about the ops team and so on. If they're all specialists on that same team, they own the code that's in production. It's not a case of I've written the code, I've given it to ops and now I don't care. They need to own the code that's in production. Right? This leads to much better outcomes because it means that if if I'm the one who spoke to the customer about what they need, or somebody on my team did, and we've written that code, and we've put it into production and made sure it works, and if somebody, if there's a failure, I'm gonna get paged at three o'clock in the morning, there's this real sense of ownership of that code um, within the team. It doesn't mean that one person needs to do all this stuff, or everybody needs to be you know, capable of doing all of these different areas, just that that feature team has their own independence and, able, and they're able to implement that stuff individually. Um, if anybody's visited the Honeycomb booth, um, Honeycomb IO booth, there's a ton of these amazing stickers from, um, I think it's their CEO, Charity Majors. And one of them says, uh, one of them's about developers being on call. This is one of my personal 
um, beliefs as well, that developers should be on call. And if you're a developer in the room, you're like, no, don't say that. Um, developers should be on call, absolutely. If you've written the code and it's going into production and it needs to wake somebody up at 3 a.m. because it's gone wrong, it should wake up the team that wrote that code. Right? If not, then you don't have ownership over it. You don't have this, um, you don't get the, the um, yeah, you don't get the ownership of the code and you can just do your work, throw it over the wall and you, know, you don't get these better outcomes. So yeah, to do this, the self-sufficient cross-functional teams, it means avoiding silos. So avoiding the ops and dev silo, yes, but also avoiding the support silo and the product manager silo, who are the only ones who speak to the customers. Avoiding those silos is super important. Avoiding specialized or common services teams is really important too. Where you can. Um, you should obviously have teams that make sure that your infrastructure is up to date across, your, across the board. Um, if you're large enough, maybe you have some security teams that make sure you know, across your organization you're performing well with security. But security should be part of that feature team as well. Right? So avoiding these common services team as like the team that does all the database stuff. Right? Um, there was a really good tweet I saw from somebody a little while ago saying, like a common implementation is is a, having a DevOps team in your organization. I'm not going to ask anybody to put their hand up to tell me whether they've got a DevOps team in their org, because that's usually embarrassing. Um, but some, I saw a really good tweet from somebody saying, having a team that does all the DevOps is like having a communications team that does all the communicating. Right? It's not really the way it works. So avoiding those teams. However, these center of excellence teams are good. So you could have a DevOps team, and the DevOps team are the ones who have the expertise around the product and around the process, so they can help these feature teams work more effectively. Or maybe you have a center of excellence team for um, your databases, and they help the feature teams implement their database indexes or whatever we do these days um, to, to do that the most effective way, right? But they're not the ones who do all that work. They're the centers of excellence. All right, let's move on to the next of these ideals, which is um, we're actually going to look at customer focus first because I want to come back to psychological safety at the end um, because I think it's the most important and most overlooked one. But we'll look at customer focus. So customer focus is about giving the entire organization, everybody who is at all responsible for the delivery of value to customers, um, gives them a, an overwhelming like a single um, North Star, like a thing that they should always be focusing on. Now, to, for software to be really successful, I would argue that the customers have to be happy. Um, again, I keep going back to Charity Major's stickers, but she's got a great sticker that's been around for a while that says, um, nines don't matter if the customers aren't happy. So you hear about these like five nines of availability. Five nines of availability for a product that everybody hates is not, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, so, customers being happy with the product is really important. Um, now, many a company has been successful um, locking their customers into a product that they absolutely need, where the customers aren't happy, but it does the job, right? That's true to a large extent. You know, if you are, if you are solving a problem that customers need solved, they're probably going to stick to your product, but they're unlikely to recommend it to other people. They're unlikely to be happy in their day jobs, and as a result, they're unlikely to be particularly productive with your software. So keeping customers happy, and by customers I mean anybody who uses the software, so your customer could be another department in your organization, keeping them happy should be an absolute focus. It solves the problem you want them to solve, uh, they want you to solve, and it does it in a way that makes their lives easier. There's nothing more effective in marketing than a customer who without prompting, recommend your product to somebody else, right? You get growth without even trying. So keeping your customers happy is super beneficial. Psychological safety we'll come back to in a sec, but it's really about creating an internal environment where you are able to question the status quo and you're able to try to make things better internally. But we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, customer focus is about helping your customer succeed and, and doing the work. Um, sorry, helping them do their work so that 
you know, their job is easier and they, they love the product that you've written for them. Um, some ways of doing that, which get overlooked a little bit in a lot of organisations, are to not get in the way of feedback. And I'm going to tie back to that, that vertical feature teams again. Quite often organisations have their dev teams and they have their um, ops teams and then they'll have their support teams over here. And to get any feedback back to the actual developers who are doing the work, you go through support and then you hit second level support and then somebody raises a ticket somewhere and then a week later maybe that gets to a developer and they look at their backlog and they're like, okay, cool, there's a problem there but it's not on my backlog. I'm not going to do that work. So you're, what you're really doing is just putting barriers in the way of getting feedback about whether what you've implemented is actually valuable to your customers. And if you remember that, the um, infinity symbol that we want to we wanted get through as fast as possible, we're putting a barrier between um, learning and the ideas in that case. Um, you don't... Yeah, you don't want your customers to feel like uh, they have to kind of get to the boss level of support to be able to actually speak to anybody. I would argue that you should also make sure that your developers don't feel like they have to get news third hand from their customers either. Um, at GitHub and a bunch of other companies I've worked at, if somebody clicks that feedback button in the product, that information actually goes directly to that feature team. So um, when I look at github.com as an example, I get this extra little staff bar thing that appears at the top that we're not really supposed to show people. But that tells me on any page who the feature team responsible for that, that page that I'm looking at is. If somebody gives feedback on that page, a customer gives feedback on that page, that feedback goes directly to that feature team. So they get that information direct. And internally, we have no issue at all with our engineers, like the people writing the actual code, reaching out to a customer and saying, hey, you've raised a ticket, you've had this problem, can we have a chat about it? Like, do you have an hour where we can jump on a call and you can show me exactly what's happening? Um, that shouldn't have to go through support. You shouldn't ever get in the way of your customers giving you feedback. And you shouldn't get in the way of the developers getting feedback from the customers either. That's much easier to do with vertical feature teams because everybody owns what's going into production and they feel like they should get the feedback. Um, the next one is about knowing what customers need and not, they want, not what they want or not what they've asked for. So what they need and not what they've asked for. And I don't mean that in a customers are stupid, they ask questions and tell you that they want this thing and they don't, you know, they're idiots. I don't mean it in that way. I mean that you should go beyond that first ask. So if they say, oh, you know, can you change the, the pagination here to 20 per page instead of 10? Rather than saying, oh, okay, sure, that sounds reasonable, let's put a setting and make it 20, you should ask them why they need a larger page. Is it because there's too much information in it and it's too busy? And, or the page refresh when you click the next page is too slow? Maybe that's the problem. Or maybe they're not getting the information they need anyway. They're like skipping through pages one at a time and then adding things up on a calculator to the side because you know, that's what the information they want is like the sum of all of these things. Right? So actually being able to talk to the customer and say, what is the problem? Like, yes, I can make it 20 per page if you want, but what are you actually trying to achieve? Um, so going a little bit deeper into that. Um, Implementation details, putting feature flags in is a fantastic way of actually testing features in production with customers before um, releasing it out to everybody. We, we actually do that a, a huge amount in GitHub. So by the time something is generally available in github.com, there's a very good chance that there have been companies and individuals using that feature for many, many months. We get staff flagged into a bunch of stuff, so sometimes we have to be careful about what we show because we've got a feature that isn't public yet. Um, but as an example, the new um, projects, so new GitHub projects feature, um, we had customers, large organizations, using that to manage all of their work for like close to a year before we actually released that to the public. And the reason we did that, well, we used feature flags to do that. So you can flag people in. If something doesn't work, you can turn the flag off and then they don't see it anymore. But it also helps you really tune what is valuable, especially for larger features and larger changes. 
Um, and this is kind of driving a thing called hypothesis-driven development. So back in the good old days, I say good old days, back in the days of like waterfall development, right, where you sat there and you worked out what the customers are going to need in 12 months' time and you just you worked out exactly what it was and then you handed it to the developers and they did it. And then in 12 months' time, you put it in production and the customers were like, well, that sucks. Like, that's not what we wanted at all, right? That was kind of driven from a, a belief that what we planned really early on was what was, you know, what was needed. It was going to be valuable. Hypothesis-driven development is, is great for DevOps because it means that you can have a theory about what the customer wants, but you're absolutely okay to be wrong about that theory. Right? We, as an example, again, the project stuff, we, the, the team thought that um, having an iteration type as like a, a column type was something that you, know, you could do a different way. People aren't necessarily going to want that like as a first class citizen, an iteration of their projects. After speaking to a bunch of customers, it turned out that pretty much everybody wants that. Everybody wants an iteration because people work in sprints or they work at least in these iterations of work. So the team was wrong and they said, okay, well, in that case, we'll do it like this and we'll implement that feature. Being able to deploy smaller and smaller pieces rather than these big three-month blocks of um, functionality means that you can have these hypotheses and you can implement that and put it into production and then learn whether it is actually valuable or not. So hypothesis-driven development is a great way of, of working as well. Um, there's a big difference between going away and doing three months of work and delivering it and the customer doesn't like it and doing you know, a week of work and delivering it and the customer doesn't like it. Yeah, you can change direction really, really quickly. It's like agile, uh, like agile applied at a much larger scale. All right. I mentioned hypothesis-driven development at the end because it's really important that you are able to fail. And this is a good example of where psychological safety can be really handy. So it comes up again and again, psychological safety, in the research from Nicole Forsgren and others as well, that psychological safe, psychologically safe organisations have better outcomes on a number of different metrics, including the delivery of software to customers and including things like the revenue of the company that has this, these engineering teams. So to summarise that, if people feel like they're safe in their organisation and trusted to make decisions, question the status quo, try things, the company itself will make more money. And I'm not just saying this as a, you know, I bet this will happen. There's data behind this, right? Um, thank God for Dr. Nicole Forsgren who puts all this stuff together and actually has these outcomes that you can, you can put on your manager's desk. Um, so psychological safety is really about allowing your, your team to fail, allowing them to question what's, what's going on and try to improve your daily work and improve the status quo and not punishing people, I guess, for, for making these suggestions, allowing some experimentation and some change. Um, in practice, um, it's all about, yeah, it's, like I mentioned, it's all about that, but it's all about being able to learn from your mistakes as well. So if you imagine an organization where there is a security breach, like something's been deployed and a, an API key's gone into production or something's been disabled where it shouldn't have been disabled, but as an engineer who made that mistake, they're like, oh, I'm just going to quickly change that back and nobody will notice. Um, but then they think, well, I really should do the right thing. And so they alert their management and say, look, this... This thing happened. Um, you know, I shouldn't have done it like that. I didn't realize that when I flicked this switch, it would do do this thing and give this security, uh, give us this security vulnerability. And the management tears them to pieces and says, "This is completely unacceptable." They go to the media and say it was human error. Somebody did the wrong thing. That person's been let go. Um, you know, it will never happen again. Uh, you know, that person's life is ruined, right? They're, they're the one who, did the, who made the mistake. But what happens then to the rest of the team is that they see that this happened, and if there is a mistake later on, they make a mistake, they're going to work really hard to cover up that mistake and make sure that nobody knows it happened, 
right? If they're not sure about something, or maybe they want to try something, but they're like, oh, it could also go wrong. And I remember when, you know, Jenny over there did this made this mistake with implementation, she got fired. I'm just going to stick to what we're doing already, right? So that's a lack of psychological safety, and that's been driven by what the organization has pushed. So ways to get around this and way to, ways to actually imp have good psychological safety in your organizations are to have actual blameless retrospectives. And this is one of those ones where companies say, we have blameless retrospectives, and the result of the last blameless retrospective is that three people lost their job, right? That's, that's not a blameless retrospective. They need to be legitimately blameless. Um, the Unicorn Project, that book I mentioned before, has an amazing example of this in practice. I would highly recommend the book even just for that. It shows, um, it actually shows both sides of it. So it shows what happens when there's a retrospective that doesn't go the right way and what happens when there is an actual blameless retrospective and how productive and how um, positive that can be. It also requires you to have these introspection sessions. So sometimes it can be really um, easy to just continue with the way that you've been doing things. You know, everything's working okay, but having introspection to sessions to say, well, is there anything that we're doing at the moment that is not working? Um, we do this in our team, actually, with the, uh, the um, DevRel team at, at GitHub. We had a meeting the other day about a... Um, we had these big project boards about the content calendar, the things we were putting out. And so every time we have new content that's coming up, like blog posts or videos or something, we'd put it in this content calendar. And we're all just finding it was very difficult to actually put that information in even though the people higher up wanted to know what, what was coming up. We had a real sit down and discussion about whether we really wanted this board because it was an extra effort. It was slowing us down. We weren't convinced anybody was really getting anything from it. And as a team, we went, okay, let's scrap it. Let's just not do it for a while and see if anybody complains, see if it slows us down. Um, that kind of introspection and safety to be able to say, okay, let's just scrap this thing. I know management thinks, it impo thinks it's important, but let's try not doing it for a while. That's really important. Um, I want to ask a question of the room as well. Who here um, has a daily stand-up? Can you put your hand up if you have a daily stand-up? All right, keep your hands up. Um, now, keep your hand up if you always find your daily stand-up valuable. All right, a lot more people put their hands down than I thought. Um, for those of you who still have your hands up, um, you can put them down now. And if your manager is sitting next to you, I understand why you kept your hand up. Um, but for the people who put their hands down who, or who wanted to, um, how safe would you feel in your organization suggesting that maybe you don't, you try a week without doing a daily stand-up? Um, and the reactions I think people get are either like, oh, no, <laughs> we've been told that that's what we're doing. I'm not going to suggest that. I'm going to get in trouble. Or maybe it's worth having that conversation. Let's just see if we can try it for a week. Now, I'm not saying that daily stand-ups aren't valuable. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I've been in organizations where they're not, but I've been in organizations where they are hugely valuable. But think about whether you feel safe enough to be able to question this thing that always happens that everybody says is valuable. If you don't think it's valuable, are you, are you in a place where you can make that suggestion? Um, and the aim here really is to be improving your daily work. Like This is what this is all about. If you're not in a, psychological safe, a psychologically safe environment, can you really improve your daily work? Or are you just going to continue making the same mistakes and doing the same things regardless of whether it's, it's useful or not? So psychological safety will also help you improve your daily work and it'll also help you have ownership over what you're putting in production. It means that you can trust your team, not that they won't make mistakes, but if they do make mistakes, they're going to let you know and you can work together to make sure those mistakes don't happen again. So the trust is there. The ownership of what gets into production is there. And all of that leads to better outcomes both for value delivered to customers, but as we've seen in a lot of the literature, that leads to better outcomes for the company as a whole. So trying to work on psychological safety of your organization is incredibly important. Without it, it's very difficult to implement any of these other changes. All right, so I've, I've talked about these three things. The overwhelming lesson here, though, is that DevOps transformation actually needs to be transformative. 
you can't just add DevOps to people's titles and expect things would change. Um, these are the three kind of areas that I think you should focus on. And if you're looking at your organization saying, we've implemented DevOps, but life is no easier. Like we're not delivering stuff faster. We're not delivering better stuff. These are the three areas to look at specifically. How can you improve your daily work so people are happier, they're more able to do their jobs, and they're able to kind of own the product from start to finish? You know, they can talk to the customer about what they want, and their team is responsible for putting that in production and making sure it is valuable in production. Like, can you make improvements to the way you work on a day-to-day -day basis to you know, push that needle a little bit further towards um, a better daily work environment? Um, psychological safety is super important for doing all of this stuff. And if you don't have that culture in your organization, um, that's a very hard problem to solve for a start. But think about um, if you're in a position where you are one of the more safe feeling people, I guess, in that organization, you're one of the seniors, try to model the behavior that you would actually like in your organization. If you think the junior developers, for example, don't feel like they can be trusted to you know, make suggestions, try to model that behavior. Be really open when you make a mistake. If you see somebody higher up from you making a mistake and owning it and saying, OK, let's put something in place so that doesn't happen again, that flows down to everybody else in the engineering organization or in the organization so that they feel much safer being able to do that. They're like, well, if that person was able to do it, then maybe I can make mistakes and I can suggest things as well. Similarly, if you get suggestions from people that you think this is just flat out wrong, rather than saying, no, that's ridiculous, we tried that, that didn't work, try to be okay with letting people fail or discover things themselves. Right? In the long run, that'll give you better outcomes because at some point, they're gonna have an idea that is super beneficial. Right? And it, but if they've been taught that any new ideas are going to be shouted down by the person who's senior from them, they're not going to suggest those ideas anymore. If they don't feel valued and they don't feel safe, they'll move somewhere else. They'll go to a different company. So try and model that behavior for everybody in your org, especially if you feel like you're safe. If, you're, if you don't feel like you're safe um, in your organization psychologically, it's a tricky thing to, to do. Um, I'm not going to tell you to leave your job and go somewhere else, but yeah, that's an option, right? Um, and then finally, this North Star of customer focus. That definition of DevOps um, about delivering value on a continuous basis to your customers is all about customer focus. Make sure that that is what you're aiming for, not how fast can I move these tickets across the board, but are these tickets valuable? And when they're in production, can we prove that they're valuable? You know, can we actually get the feedback from the customer to learn whether they're valuable, or are we just trusting we did the right thing? Right. Try to focus on what the customer needs or what the user needs. Right, I've said a whole lot of words. I haven't talked about any Helm charts or anything like that. I'm happy to do so if you really want to. Well, probably not Helm charts. I'm terrible at those. But I'm happy to talk about some more in, like, intricate details and details about individual environments. I'm around for the rest of the conference. This is the last talk I have until PubConf on Saturday. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. The easiest way to get hold of me is Twitter. I'm on Twitter about 28 hours a day. If I'm not on Twitter, it's because the plane doesn't have Wi-Fi or I'm asleep. Um, I have a two and a four-year-old though, so the asleep part is only a couple of hours a day. But definitely reach out to me. Come and catch me at the conference. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. Um, finally, I have some stickers I'm just going to scatter along here as well. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.